of the series. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, and the series is called Overturned. What we're going to discover throughout the whole series, I'm going to tell you right now so that you'll know and you'll see it, but there are two distinct kind of features of the Gospel of Matthew. Number one, Matthew uses more Old Testament quotes than any other New Testament book. Secondly, Matthew speaks distinctly about the kingdom of heaven, which means if you put those two concepts together, it lets us know that God has had a plan from the very beginning. The Old Testament. God was doing something and has been doing something from the beginning and has had a plan from the beginning to bring his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, to bear on the earth, which means for us that God has been and continues to overturn those things that, that, that are broken in the world and broken in our lives. He's bringing heaven to earth, and he's been doing it for a long time. So we are going to be looking at the next several weeks about the things that the kingdom of God overturns, either in our culture or overturns in our lives. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4 today, because we're going to be Matthew through the whole series. We're going to be Matthew 4. Let's take a look at verses 12 through 17. Matthew chapter 4. And when they heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness, have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see both of these distinct features, a quote from Isaiah from the Old Testament, and this mention of the kingdom of heaven being at hand. But look at this incredible statement. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is now here. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus is proclaiming as he walks into this region, is now on the earth. And throughout the series, we're going to see what that means. What it simply means is that everywhere that the king of heaven steps onto the scene, the kingdom of heaven is present at hand. And once the king of heaven has been there, the kingdom of heaven is now accessible there. The king of heaven has shown up, Jesus is saying, which means the kingdom of heaven is there, which means we have access to a new ruler, a new leader, a, a new authority. We have access to a, a new way of life. We're no longer only subject to the way things are because the king has shown up the king has brought with him his kingdom, which means you and I now have access to a completely different way of living. Our passage starts off in verse 12 and says, Now when he had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. Now, leaving Nazareth, that's a, um, that's a very kind way of saying he got thrown out of the city and they tried to kill him. Jesus came to Capernaum from Nazareth, the place of his birth, his hometown. And he left Nazareth. It sounds so nice. Like, let's go on a hiking trip, you know, seven miles down the road. It, it wasn't that. He was chased out of town. We'll see here in just a second. They actually tried to throw him off a cliff. And instead, he left Nazareth and went to Capernaum. But let's, let's look at why he was found himself in that situation in the first place. We're going to just take a little side note as we're working our way through Matthew 4. We're going to take a little side note over into Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, sorry, yeah, 18 to 21, speaking of Jesus, and he came to Nazareth. So, right, Luke, Matthew has him leaving Nazareth. This is his entry into Nazareth. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. 
And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture, again from Isaiah, which he's about to talk about down in Capernaum, but right now he's again reading from the Old Testament. He's saying, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He, he just made a powerful proclamation about himself. He reads from a 700-year-old script of promises that these people had been holding on to while the world was jacked up, while their society was in turmoil, while their own personal lives were in a place of struggle. They had been holding to something that God had said 700 years before. And now Jesus walks up and goes, I know you've been waiting for those. Guess what? Ta-da! Today's the day. These are now fulfilled. You've been waiting for them to be true, and I'm here to tell you that I'm the king. And where I go, my kingdom is at hand, and my kingdom is fulfilled. He's essentially saying, I'm here under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to proclaim to you that you no longer have to be a hostage to bad news, to poorness, to captivity, to blindness, to oppression, to a lack of favor. He's saying this has been the condition of your lives. But the king has arrived, and with him, his kingdom that offers good news, liberty, recover of sight, Liberty again, because why not twice? And the Lord's favor. Now that I'm here, the conditions that you used to live under, you no longer have to live under those. There's actually, in my arrival, there's a new way that you can live. That has been the conditions of your life, but the king has arrived, and with him, a new way, because there's a new kingdom. This passage in Isaiah that you've been hoping would come to pass has been fulfilled. Jesus is essentially saying, look, the second I showed up, it moved from a someday wish to a present reality. It's here. Now, that doesn't mean that you are free. It doesn't mean that you no longer are immediately moved from one kingdom to the other. But by the arrival of a new kingdom, with the arrival of that new king, it just means that you are no longer involuntarily subject to the way things have been. When there's only one kingdom, when there's only one option, when there's only one possible way to live, you're subject to that. You don't have a choice but this is just the way it is. There's blindness. There's brokenness. There's oppression. And you're hoping it someday that passage from Isaiah gets fulfilled. And now when Jesus shows up and says it is fulfilled, what he's now saying is you now have another option. You now have, there's a way that you lived, but now there's an option whereby you don't have to live the way that you did. There's an arrival of a new kingdom. You're not immediately free just because the kingdom came, but you no longer have to live subject to oppression. Kingdom is now, kingdom of heaven is now an option. If you choose to live by it. Some of you heard this a long time ago. I haven't shared it in a while, but I'll share it again because it makes sense right now. I was traveling on a mission trip several, several years ago, 
and I had a long layover in the London airport. So I had gone out into the city, and I came back, and I'm just sitting there, and, and everybody was gathered around the, like, the TV. You don't get the TVs in the terminal, and like, everybody was sitting there staring at this TV, and I'm like, I don't really know what's happening in London news, but everybody seemed super interested, so I started watching. And London had just built a brand new exhibit for their grizzly bears, the London Zoo. Like, the, the, the bear used to be in a cage that was about, well, about this far by this far. Just a little square cage, and you got this massive, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds, just force of nature grizzly bear. And at the zoo, he had been contained in this cage where he could walk from here, there, and back. That was the extent of his domain, was about 10 feet in either direction. And they had just built this unbelievable big enclosure. It had like trees for him to rip apart and big giant tractor tires. And like, I mean, it's like a gri Disneyland for a grizzly bear. It had things for him to stick his claws into and bite and chew and things that moved like it was a natural, this incredible habitat. And we're all sitting there watching and they, they like had the cage and they, they like brought it in and set it right in the middle of this enclosure. And then they lifted the bars and the bear, now with access to the entirety of this new playground, walked 10 feet in this direction and turned around and walked 10 feet in this direction. And everybody thought, which tree is he going to rip apart first? We have no idea because he just paced back and forth. There were no longer bars, but he didn't access what was now available. He wasn't constrained by his environment any longer. A new world had been made available to him. Somebody else had provided for him the space to expand himself, but he just, he was used to going from here to here, and that's all he did. And it was like the least impressive, like everybody's kind of like, shoot, like do, go, do, go do bear stuff, like go be a grizzly. We're like, Okay, and then people just kind of got bored and went back to whatever they do in the airport. It was completely unimpressive. And Jesus shows up on the scene to a people who had been limited by the oppression, the blindness, the brokenness of the world. You could really thrive to this point and no further, and maybe you could walk back the paths of oppression that you've been on. It was only, it was limited. They did not have access to liberty, and then Jesus shows up and, and removes the bars, lifts the cage up out of the way, and it's like, look, the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom where you're blind, where you're oppressed, where you're in poverty, not that kingdom, a new one has arrived, you're in it, but you have to access it. Like, you can walk 11 feet and 12 feet, you can step outside of what you've known. This passage, you were hoping someday, what will this new enclosure look like for me? He said, today's the day. Just because it's there doesn't mean we have it, but it does mean that forever we can voluntarily choose it. And some, in the presentation of this passage in Luke chapter 4, said, that sounds awesome. Others didn't like that so much. They didn't like it so much, in fact, if you remember me talking about his venture here in Nazareth, they didn't like it so much that they're like, you need to be quiet. And he's like, yeah, but there's a new kingdom. <laughs> and they literally chased him out of town to the edge of a cliff where they were intent, Luke tells us, to throw him off. He did some supernatural razzmatazz and walks through the crowd that's trying to throw him off a cliff and walks on out of Nazareth. Kindly, as Matthew said, he left Nazareth and headed down to Capernaum. But here's the thing with the kingdom of God. Just because it's available doesn't mean we choose it. In fact, to not choose it is actually to actively reject it. Because Jesus came and said, here it is. Like, there, it's, it's, it's one thing when we don't have access to the kingdom. We're not necessarily actively rejecting God. We just kind of have a choice of the way life is, and the choice is option A. 
But when he comes and opens up freedom and, and liberty and these things and says, hey, it's here now, it's right here, you and I are now have to make the active choice to say, I understand that that's there, but I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to enter what you're inviting me into. So after proclaiming Isaiah, the Old Testament, letting them know it was fulfilled, Jesus heads back down. We'll pick it back up in Matthew. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, going back to Isaiah again, might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them a light has dawned. He had walked into Nazareth and said, guess what guys? I know you've been living oppressed. I know you've been living blind know that you've been living poor, but the Spirit of God, the anointing from heaven is on me to tell you that this promise you've been hanging on to is being fulfilled today. I'm here to proclaim liberty and recover of sight. I'm here to tell you this is the way it is. What Isaiah said, and you've been trusting for 700 years, is here. They weren't big fans of it, so he heads down to Capernaum, to another group of people and starts to tell them the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember, and he's, he's in now the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. And he's saying, you people, like the kingdom has arrived and their predicament, their individual life predicament and sort of their socio, sociological predicament was a similar, but it had played itself out, similar to what had happened in Nazareth, but it had played itself out over the years a little bit differently. These are people who had been taken captive by the Assyrian Empire. They had suffered brutality as a two tribes. In the day of Isaiah, they were the two most prominent tribes in the northern kingdom. And when Assyria had rolled in and had taken them captive, and, and they had suffered mightily, so much so that the, the text says, like, the shadow of death. It's almost like darkness has rolled into the land. There was such a heaviness, such a, pre uh, uh, a, a dark presence, so much barbaric activity. Like It's almost like the light was blocked out and this dark shadow, this shadow of death had rolled in and you were taken captive and many were slaughtered and many were taken away and led away and never brought back. And these, the people that lived up in that region were like, oh my God, where are you? And the prophet Isaiah spoke to them and said, I understand, essentially, your predicament. I know that darkness has shown itself, and I know that death has shown itself, but let me tell you, there's a light that's coming. There's a light that's coming to your land. Jesus walked into that land, quoted that passage, and said, guys, the kingdom, repent, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, the, in case you didn't, haven't read anything about heaven in scripture, among the amazing attributes of it, it says that there's no darkness. There's no shadow. So a light is now dawning in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali. By the way, I'm the light. Here I am. I am now bringing to this place that had no other option of how to live, but under this oppressive historical cloud of being ravaged by the Assyrians, I am now coming and we are opening up, we're removing the bars. There's a new way by which you can choose to live. Now it's amazing because this passage, put, put, it, put it back up, Marcy, if you would, for me for just a second. This comes from Isaiah chapter nine that Jesus is quoting here. Go, go back just a teeny bit. And let's, uh, all right, this is Isaiah chapter nine. Verses one and two, the land of Zebulun, it's also in this, so Jesus is directly quoting Isaiah chapter nine. 
the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, where, where his feet currently are, that place, the one that's by the sea, the one that's beyond the Jordan, the one that is Galilee of the Gentile, like right here is what he's saying. You, you're the people that have been living, been dwelling in darkness. Hmm. But you've seen a great light. Keep going. For those dwelling in this whole region and the shadow of death that's been sitting on this region, on them, on you people, a light has dawned. This is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. If Isaiah 9 rings a bell for any reason, if you're like, why, why, why do I feel like I've heard of Isaiah 9? Because he continues to talk about Isaiah, about these people, and he goes on, and right around verses 6 and 7 and 8, you may have heard those around Christmas time. Because he starts to speak about this light who has come, this light that's going to dawn, this new way of the kingdom of God coming, and he starts to say, for to us, people living in the shadow of death, those of us trapped in darkness that feel like there's no way out, to us, a child's born. He's going to be called the Prince of Peace. He's going to be called Everlasting Father. He's going to be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God. Listen, there is one that's going to come when you find yourself d where, where the only option to live is just to, to hunker down under darkness, to be a scattered people, to not have any sense of purpose, and, and hanging on to the promises of God. One's going to come, and I'll tell you who he's going to be. He's going to be that little baby. The Prince of Peace that's prophesied that we talk about over Christmas is going to be the one that's going to show up, and when he comes as the king, he is bringing with him light into the darkness. And now Jesus, the one that was prophesied, shows up. Come on, somebody. He walks in and says, hey, Naphtali, you know these prophecies about how dark things are and that light's coming? Guess what? The child who was born, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Almighty God, guess what? He's here. And with him comes the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. Which means after talking to the folks in Nazareth and saying, you don't have to live bound, you don't have to live blind, the, all those, the, it's, it's been fulfilled, I'm here, and I'm opening it up and establishing the capacity to live in the kingdom of heaven. They said, yeah, yeah, not today, sir, get out of here. So he goes down to Capernaum, walks in there, and basically tells them the exact same thing, but specific to their situation. You've been hanging on for 700 years, wondering when light would come. Surprise. Here it is. Here I am. A great light has arrived for those living in the shadow of death, the isolated, the captive, the blind, the bound, the oppressed. It's here. Wonderful for them. What does that mean for us? It means, just like in Luke chapter 4, where oppression and poverty and those things that he was anointed to set us free from, while those were still an option that you could choose, this also means for us that darkness is still an option that you can choose. The light's here, but you and I can still actively reject, reject it, but we can also receive it. We now have another option by which we can live. It was for them, but the, uh, when Jesus came and established the kingdom, because he says this is what he started to preach. Let me tell you, he's still preaching it. It's the only thing he'll ever preach. Light is here, kingdom of heaven. Choose that, choose life. 
Choose light. Choose the kingdom of heaven. There's another way you can live, which you have been under, but there's also now the capacity to choose in Christ the kingdom. We don't have to live in darkness. You, you know, darkness is a funny thing. Because the same space, when it's light, can be fun and can be awesome. And when you turn the lights off, it's amazing how creepy a place can get, isn't it? You ever notice that? When, when I grew up, my, we, we lived in, in our neighborhood, we had like a long backyard, and in the backyard we had this ravine with just thick woods. Let me tell you, as a young boy, it was amazing. An older brother, we used to go down there and just, God, we, we lived in the, like we were in the woods all the time climbing trees, building forts. It was amazing. But my, my parents, like they, they had a, we had a fireplace in the house, primarily heated with a fireplace and whatever, like a wood-burning fireplace. And so because we had all this woods in the back, there was always fallen trees. And my dad would go out there and with chainsaws and brr, brr, brr. And we had, so we had this big honking wood pile. But it was, it was gigantic wood pile was right at the entrance to the woods, to the ravine that went down. We played out there all the time. But the worst thing would be like at night when you're, you know, we're kind of in, it's dark out, especially like if it was winter time. So they'd have a, my parents would have a fire stoked up, like sitting inside with a fire crackling and the TV on and the family around and drinking hot chocolate was so great. Until my dad wanted more wood for the fire. You know, it's a snowy tromp out to there, but worse than the fact that it was cold is our back porch light didn't reach all the way to the wood pile. It lit about half the backyard. And can I tell you, this place that during the day, I had more delight and more joy and more fun, when it was dark, was terrifying. Dude, I swear, every ax murderer that's ever been in a movie lived just behind the wood pile at night. Right? It never crossed my mind that like the dude from Halloween and Freddy Krueger, like never crossed my mind that those guys were out there during the day. But as soon as that back patio light wouldn't reach there, they all spent the night there. And I'd be like, Dad, like, huh. I mean, listen, I'm not scared of many things. But as a young kid, I was terrified to walk out and get wood over a place that I'd been all the time because it was, it was dark. I'm not even scared of the dark. Never have been, except for that creepy wood pile by the creepy woods that were amazing when it was light out. But darkness has a way, right, of, of paralyzing us, of making us see stuff that isn't there, of thinking thoughts that just wouldn't make sense in the light. In the case of Naphtali and Zebulon, of recounting their history of being drawn away, and this is the land where it happened. And God didn't show up in time. And for centuries, that urban legend just hung over the land. And the reality is, some of the dark things in our mind, or dark things in our heart, or dark things we've engaged in, or dark things that were done in our direction, those things just grow when they stay in the dark, they get scarier in the dark. We can't see clearly. It's more confusing. And Jesus shows up to them and to us. He says, the light's here. It's me. You can invite me into. No, forget that. Forget inviting me into. You can step out of the shadow anytime you want. You don't have to live in the darkness. You don't have to live bound. You don't have to live blind. You don't have to live paralyzed. The light has dawned, and now you have the option. You're no longer invol involuntarily trapped. You can choose to go, it's dark on this side of the line, but Jesus had said, I can do this, and step fully into the light. The kingdom of God overturns darkness. 
because the kingdom of God brings light wherever the king goes. Let's complete our passage. From that time, Jesus began to preach. Worship team, come help me out. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time. All that Jesus said, all that he did, all that he proclaimed, all that he demonstrated, the totality of the ministry of Jesus is summed up right here. He basically came and said, second part first, the kingdom's here. (laughs) Because the king is here, the kingdom is here. And every place he went into, whatever their version of darkness was, he stood right beside it or stepped into the middle of it and turned the light on. Everywhere. Everywhere Jesus went, light was brought to darkness. And people were given the option of repent. Of turning from the darkness in which they had become accustomed or turning from the darkness that they felt trapped in or stepping out of the darkness where they never knew that there was another option. He came and either stood in the middle of it or stood right next to it, shined super bright and said, hey, guess what? I know that's dark, but you're not never gonna believe what it's like over here. Like this is heaven on earth is right here because the king has come the king of heaven, I brought the kingdom of heaven. And all you have to do is step from there to here. That's it. In fact, if you need me to like help you, I will. All you gotta do is turn and look this way and something in your heart go, how do I get to that? I'll I'll get you to it. But at some level, you gotta choose. Stay stuck dark. In fact, you can throw me off a cliff if you want to give it your best shot. You can try to silence me, but I'm here. And when I'm here as the kingdom, as the king, here is the kingdom. And I'm going to go over to that city and light that one up too. I don't, I'm not taking my light with me. You're, here's your option. You can always turn to me. But you do need to turn to me. Which is what repent means. Turn to Jesus, He overturns everything in your life. The things that have felt dark, the things that have felt unnecessarily creepy and scary, the things where our imagination gets away from us of how life is always going to have to be this way, we can actually turn from those and see and step into a glorious light. Just like what was extended to the folks in Galilee turn around and he turns it upside down and by the way that has always been God's plan that's why he had prophets talk about it 700 years before Jesus came and did it that's why we're going to see through the series the psalmist telling us it's coming so that when he finally shows up what feels to us like finally but when he arrives on the scene with the answers we've been waiting in anticipation and you and I have the beautiful privilege of not having to wait in anticipation like them because when Jesus said the kingdom is at hand the kingdom is here the kingdom hasn't left so he established a new place a new space a new approach to life he established that And it will be that way until he comes and wraps up time and space. And all he's going to do there is not bring the kingdom. He's just going to eliminate the other option. Darkness will no longer be an option. But for right now, light is an option. And all we have to do is say, woohoo, and turn to it. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your kingdom being here, being at hand. We thank you you walked into Nazareth and you faced rejection 
by those who weren't ready to hear what you were anointed by God's Spirit to bring to us. May that never be true of us, that we would push you away when you're trying to bring to us life and life and freedom. But Jesus, we thank you that one setback didn't discourage you. You just walked to the next town, (laughs) proclaimed the same message that was most appropriate for them. You left from there and from that day forward until you wrap up time and space. Your proclamation is, turn to me. The kingdom of God is right here. sitting here today and you've never made that first turn. I'm going to pray specifically for two people, two groups of people. You've never repented. You've never turned in the first place. Been living in darkness and now it's like, whoa, I have another option? Yes. Yes, you do. If that's you, you've never turned from darkness to the light and life in Christ. Would you raise your hand so I know who I'm praying? if that's what you want to do right now. All right, praise God. Here's your prayer and those of you online. Lord Jesus, I'm done living my own way. I'm done being my own boss. I'm tired of the darkness, the blindness, all those things that you came to set me free from this point say no to those because you died on the cross and rose again you've opened access for me into the kingdom of heaven today I receive what you did and I step out in the light be my lord be my boss be my king from this day forward till we meet face to face in Jesus name some of you stepped into light accepted Jesus' offer of salvation and forgiveness, but you kind of forgot what that was like. Maybe you've got some areas that are stuck. Maybe areas that don't feel as free and it's been a grind and how do I get this entanglement off of me? When Jesus didn't come and talk about how to get untangled, he just said, step over here. Step out. There's a different way. You don't have to live by that anymore. The kingdom is at hand. I fulfilled liberty from all those things that just seem to entangle you. And if you would just like to receive today, stepping out of those things that have just felt encumbering, I believe that God's going to supernaturally set you free right now. Nobody's looking at you, but I'd like to see who I'm praying for. Raise your hand if that's you. Yep, 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 yep. Here's your prayer. Jesus, I'm done. (laughs) I can't figure it out. I can't make it work. But the truth is, Jesus, I trust in your kingdom at hand. I let go right now of the anger. I let go of the defeat. I let go of the entanglement. I'm just letting go of it, and I'm stepping into the kingdom that you make possible. You said that you would give sight to the blind. You said that you would declare the day of the Lord's favor. You said it. I'm letting liberty be free of me, be, 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 be true of me, right now in this moment. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and untangle those chains, take them off the heart, take them off the mind, take them off their situations, break them, bust them up, and throw them far from your sons and daughters this morning. The kingdom is at hand. The light has dawned. And we say, oh, Prince of Peace, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, a everlasting Father. Have your way. I am firmly with you. Holy Spirit, flush all those.
encumbrances off. They're over there in the dark ways of the world. Your sons and daughters that just acknowledged you are standing firmly in your way of life. We thank you. It's your kingdom. Because you're king, your kingdom, heaven on earth, is here.